Welcome to the Skeptic Track. Um, our next speaker is Abby Hoff Hoffer. Hafer. She, Hafer, excuse me. Oh, I can't read my own doctor handwriting. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, she has a PhD in uh, human, uh, she teaches uh, human anatomy and physiology at, uh, at uh, Curry College in Massachusetts. Uh, PhD uh, from Oxford um, and ha has a book available. Uh, she has one copy left called, because I got the other one. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, why, uh, not so intelligent designer, why evolution explains the human body and intelligent design does not. She also has another book that's in press called Darwin's <coughs> Apostles. Look for that in 2019, please. Her Hogwarts house is Ravenclaw, and she actually used to, she played the sorting hat at, uh, uh, some, at, a, haunted at a haunted house one time, which I think <laughs> is fantastic. So anyway, please welcome Abby Hafer. Yay! beginning, it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. I don't know if you heard that old bad excuse for homophobia when you were growing up, but I did. There's just one problem with that, and it's this. It's wrong in every possible way. It's stupid. There is absolutely nothing correct about that statement. So let's just start again, and I'll do it right this time. In the beginning, there was one sex, and it was female. <laughs> An individual reproduced by growing a copy of herself and releasing that copy into the environment. This was certainly the case with the first self-copying molecule. Since life began with the first self-copying molecule, this means that females are the first original sex. Let that sink in for a while. In the beginning, it wasn't Adam and Eve. It was Eve. In the beginning, it wasn't this. It was this. Now, this is a picture of bacteria replicating, that is, copying themselves, and bacteria came along well after that first self-copying molecule. But individual molecules don't photograph very well, so I'm showing you bacteria because bacteria are still pretty ancient. So Eve, that first self-copying organism, made copies of herself. And those copies made more copies and more copies and more copies. Sometimes those copies had mutations. So in biblical terms, Eve begat Eve, and Eve, and Eve, and Eve, and one of those Eves had a mutation, that is a slight genetic change, and begat a line of Evelyn's. Some of these <laughs> mutated further and begat lines of Edith's and Edna's. Meanwhile, the Eves were still busy begetting more Eves, but some of those mutated and became Esme's and Esmeralda's. So the first family didn't look like this but more like this. <laughs> so females were really doing pretty well before males came along. Thank you very much. <laughs> the problems began when Eve's daughters Edith and Esmeralda started competing with each other. And thus was the evolutionary arms race begun. The problem was made worse by the fact that Edith continued to mutate and got new advantages over Esmeralda. Meanwhile, poor Esmeralda didn't always mutate fast enough to keep up. Many lines of Esmeraldas were wiped out because of this, and that was the end of their evolutionary line. But then, a mutation took place that allowed some Esmeraldas to swap genes with other members of the population, members who were not Esmeraldas. And this gene swapping saved the day. That's because some of these newly acquired genes allowed the new Esmeraldas to compete successfully with that pesky Edith. The new Esmeralda was no longer a pure Esmeralda, it was true, but by golly, she was alive. So the new improved Esmeraldas got ahead in the evolutionary arms race. And it was good. 
<laughs> and that, folks, is how sex was born. And it was good. According to evolutionary biologist W.D. Hamilton, one major benefit that sexual reproduction gives us is the ability to stay ahead of parasites. Parasites work by adapting very precisely to a very specific host species. The only potential hosts that are likely to survive are those that have the ability to mix their genetics quickly through sexual reproduction and spread beneficial mutations through the population quickly, also by sexual reproduction. Other biologists have also suggested that the gene exchange done by sexual reproduction also means that siblings are not exact copies of one another and are therefore less likely to compete directly with one another for survival. But one way or another, that's what males are for. Males are genetic mixers. They speed up evolutionary change. Since a male's genes can only survive by contributing to somebody else's reproduction, Males have evolved a wide variety of mechanisms for trying to persuade a female to mate with them. There's showing off. Everybody knows about peacocks using their tails to show off to attract mates, but did you know about Technicolor vomit? <laughs> Crustaceans called ostracods vomit luminous mucus in order to attract mates. Isn't that sexy? <laughs> There's also showering females with gifts. Humans do this. Did you know that bowerbirds do too? Here's a male bowerbird making a really showy nest to attract a female. Here's the finished product. There's also trapping females. Trapping isn't pretty, but evolution isn't pretty. There's growing longer penises than the competition. This is what barnacles do. Barnacles are stationary as adults. So getting sperm to the nearest female is a challenge for male barnacles. They also have to compete with each other over this. They are up to the challenge. Barnacles can grow penises up to eight times the length of their own bodies. Barnacles have the longest penises in the world, compared to their body length, anyway. Remember this the next time that somebody brags about the size of theirs. <laughs> so, I've explained why sexual reproduction is useful. Let's move on to the whole question of what is natural. The cartoon here, of course, depicts unnatural acts with a sheep. <laughs> this brings up a really important point. People will spend a whole lot of time telling you what kind of sex is natural and what kind of sex is unnatural, according to them. But you have just learned that sexual reproduction exists as a means of genetic mixing. That's all it is. This genetic mixing does not require a specific set of gender or sexual characteristics. So I'm going to state a bunch of mistaken assumptions that people have about sex and gender, and then take a look at males and females throughout the animal kingdom. You will see how brilliantly creative natural selection can be and how diverse the results are in the animal kingdom. There's no one set of rules. Sexuality is a free-for-all. You will also begin to notice how many of these mistaken assumptions are based on some humans' wishful thinking, usually about what they would like to see in their own human society. Mistaken assumption number one. Evolution means that males will have no parental involvement and will leave care of the infants and children to females, right? Wrong. Here's just one example. Emus. Aww. Those big flightless birds from Australia. Once the eggs are laid, the male emu is the one who takes care of the eggs and incubates them. Once the eggs hatch, the male raises the chicks. Mistaken assumption number two. 
Evolution means that males will always be bigger than females and will dominate them, right? Wrong. Here is a picture of an anglerfish, which is actually a picture of three anglerfish. Male anglerfish are tiny compared to females. To continue their existence past a certain age, a male anglerfish must attach himself to a female and fuse his body with hers. This female anglerfish has two attached males. In the biological sciences, having different sexes of different sizes is called sexual dimorphism. You can tell that the people who invented this term were men. Since the term sexual dimorphism is defined as males being bigger than females. When the females of a species are larger than the males, this is called reverse sexual dimorphism. <laughs> In other words, human male biologists just assumed that males being bigger than females was the natural state of being. <laughs> Mistaken assumption number three. But males are always the ones with the Y chromosomes, right? Wrong. <clears throat> birds. All birds. All male birds have two X chromosomes. It's the females who have the Y chromosomes. This is true for some male insects, like moths and butterflies as well, and some crustaceans and some reptiles, including the huge lizards called Komodo dragons. It's called the ZW system instead of the XY system, but that's just to make it easier to talk about it. Mistaken assumption number four. Males and females have separate bodies, right? Wrong. Many animals are hermaphrodites. That is, they have both male and female reproductive organs. Most snails are hermaphrodites. So are many jellyfish and many worms. Mistaken assumption number five. But male input is always required for reproduction, right? No. Bonnet head sharks, black tip sharks, leopard sharks, zebra sharks, small white spotted bamboo sharks, many snakes including boa constrictors, a brand new <clears throat> all female species of crayfish, and 50 species of lizards including Komodo dragons can all reproduce without males. <clears throat> Sorry, my, infer my imperfect vocal system is not working right now. Mistaken assumption number six. But we always see pictures from the Bible of animals being saved from Noah's flood by going onto a boat two by two. One female and one male. That's what's natural, right? Two by two, one female and one male? Not quite. First, Many species have some male homosexual individuals. For instance, rams. Yes, rams, that very symbol of raging male horniness. Rams are male sheep. About 8% of all rams form exclusively male-to-male -male pair bonds, forsaking all contact with female sheep. Some animals routinely practice lesbianism. For instance, this species of albatross has many same-sex female pairs who nest and raise chicks together. Some animals form trios. Some trios are for child rearing. For instance, these skuas. Skuas often nest as mixed-sex trios and raise chicks together. And some trios are for sex. This is a North Atlantic right whale. And this is a photograph of a female North Atlantic right whale having simultaneous sex with two males at once. And when I say simultaneous, I mean simultaneous. <laughs> by the way, is an example of a multi-male breeding system where each female may have many male partners. 
For something more biblical, there are also multi-female breeding systems, that is, where one male may have many female partners. For instance, northern fur seals. This is a male northern fur seal with its many females, just like the Old Testament. <laughs> but what about primates, I hear you cry, our near relatives in the animal kingdom? Well, it turns out that our fellow primates have all different kinds of breeding systems. Here's a graph for you. This graph shows that some species of our fellow primates have multi-male breeding systems. Those are the solid dots on the graph. Some have multi-female breeding systems. Those are the open triangles. And some have monogamous breeding systems. Those are the open circles. As for humans, we are the little plus sign near the upper right. This graph, by the way, is a plot of testicle weight versus body weight in primates. <laughs> Somebody checked to see if there was a correlation between that ratio and mating systems, but the results were not clear. You should know that homosexuality, lesbianism, and bisexuality are all found within non-human primates as well. Mistaken assumption number seven. But at least males are males and females are females, right? None of this cross-dressing or transsexual <laughs> stuff, right? Wrong. Transsexual fish are common. First, barramundi. These fish transition from male to female. Most individuals mature as males. They become females after one or more spawning seasons. Most of the larger specimens are therefore female. Second, blue gropers. These change from female to male. This is a blue groper female. That's correct, it's not blue. It's the males that are blue. Blue gropers are a type of wrasse. Wrasses are famous for changing their sex usually female to male. All blue gropers begin life as females. This is a blue groper male. Here's how you get a blue groper male. Usually you will find only one or two blue gropers in an area. Sorry, usually you will find one or two male blue gropers in an area and a larger number of female gropers in the same area. Then, when the dominant male dies, the largest female grows, changes color and sex, and becomes the dominant male. Third, clownfish. These change from whatever to male or female. Yes, Nemo himself was gender fluid. <laughs> clownfish start life with no functioning gonads. They are neither sex. There is one breeding pair with a large female, a smaller male, and a bunch of non-sexual, or sometimes male, smaller individuals. If the female dies, then the male becomes the female. If the male dies, then the largest non-breeding fish becomes male. Fourth, dwarf hawkfish. These are even more gender fluid. Hawkfish live in harems with one dominant male mating with several females. When it comes to sex change, the size of the harem matters. Listen carefully now because the plot to this is worse than a soap opera. <laughs> if a male hawkfish takes on too many females, then one of the largest females will change sex, become male, and take over half the harem. But if that new male hawkfish loses a few females to other harems and is challenged by a larger male, then it goes back to being female. That way it doesn't lose precious energy fighting a losing battle. So the ability to change sex in both directions maximizes an individual's ability to reproduce. So, gender fluidity is the name of the game for many species. Mistaken assumption number eight. 
Okay, so it is clear that nature does not define sex roles, and it is clear that gender fluidity is real, but at least there are two sexes, right? I mean at most two, maybe one and a half or one, but two at most, right? Wrong again. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, meet Tetrahymena thermophila, the oh. organism with the most creative sex life that I know about. It has seven sexes. You heard me, seven. No wonder it's one of my favorite organisms. <laughs> This single-celled creature, which has been thoroughly studied by biologist Eduardo Arias, mostly reproduces without sex, dividing into two identical daughter cells. That's Eve begetting Eve again. But when food is scarce, the creature can opt for sexual reproduction, which, as I told you before, creates novel genetic combinations that may give daughter cells a better chance of surviving in a harsh environment. Such tough conditions also rewarded the creatures when they developed more sexes. I'm very glad that the faith and morality of my ancestors has been revised and improved. I do not consider our modern society to be less moral than that earlier one. I consider it to be more moral. Next, Jewish dietary laws. <laughs> These pass the non-supernatural test of morality. Why? Because no harm is done, and if people wish to express their cultural affiliation in this way, then that is their choice. Following these laws, because they are written in a holy book, it doesn't make someone a better person for following them, but it doesn't make them a worse one either. Next, helping the poor because your religion tells you to. This passes the non-supernatural test of morality. The action is good, and the motivation is, in this case, irrelevant. So now we get to recent history. On June 12, 2016, an armed man killed 49 people and wounded another 53 people in a terrorist attack on a gay nightclub in Orlando, Florida called Pulse. The murderer claimed that he was inspired by the Islamic State. Is the Islamic State anti-gay? Why, yes it is. What's more, during the months that led up to the shooting, the United States had been treated to a whole series of so-called bathroom bills. These bills require transsexual people to use the public bathrooms that match their original birth gender, regardless of their current gender identity. However, that's only the tip of the iceberg. For instance, in North Carolina's infamous bathroom bill, we heard about trans people and bathrooms. But that bill also allowed employment discrimination based on sexual orientation. It allowed discrimination against LGBT customers. It allowed discrimination against LGB LGBT people in accommodations and it said that no city or locality could enact laws preventing these types of discrimination. Although some Christians opposed these bathroom bills, many others supported this type of discrimination against LGBT people, and they did it in the name of their God. Here's a quote from one. I'll read it out to you. I believe that God got it right in Genesis 5 and 2 when he made them male and female. If God didn't give you access to a male or female bathroom via your anatomy, neither should we give you access via ordinance or legislation, period. And that was spoken in the chamber of the North Carolina legislature in 2016. This guy is claiming to speak for God. He is also using a so-called holy book to justify his bigotry. This is just one example. And this was the political atmosphere in the United States just prior to the Pulse nightclub shooting. So we have Christians who claim to speak 
for a supernatural entity when they say that LGBT folks are bad. And we have Islamists shooting people because of a so-called holy book that claims to speak for a supernatural entity. Here's a clue. Nobody can honestly speak for a supernatural entity. <laughs> That includes the people who wrote the so-called holy books. If shooting someone is bad, then shooting someone is bad, period. If you try to excuse it by referring to a so-called holy book, it is still bad. A so-called holy book is no excuse for bad behavior. Any so-called word of God cannot be used morally to justify bad actions. But here is my most important point. Most people already accept the non-supernatural test of morality. Even most people who believe in the supernatural already accept the non-supernatural test of morality. How do I know this? Consider the Bible. In it, there are numerous references to slavery, to selling your children, to rape, and to genocide. The Bible does not condemn any of these heinous practices. The Ten Commandments are silent on all these subjects with the exception of killing. However, even with killing, God tells the Israelites to kill all the Canaanites, every man, woman, and child. That is, God tells them to commit genocide. And they do. Then the Bible acts like that's okay because a supernatural being said that it was okay. Now you know why I don't trust the word of supernatural beings. And I especially don't trust the word of people who claim to speak for them. Most other people don't trust them either. Allow me to demonstrate this to you. If I ask a fundamentalist of any stripe if they would kill me if God told them to, the honest ones will say yes, they would kill me if God told them to. On the other hand, if God tells me to kill them, I won't do it. So my question to you is this. Who would you rather sit next to on a public bus? <laughs> you can see from this that we have already entered the world of the non-supernatural test of morality. We like the non-supernatural test of morality. The non-supernatural test of morality is what most people already use, whether they admit it or not. In addition, most people today would say that slavery, selling your children, rape, and genocide are all immoral, even though the Bible says that these things are all okay. Again, we have already entered the world of the non-supernatural test of morality. And it's a better world. In this better world, no one has any divine rights. Men don't have God-given dominion over women. Humans don't have God-given dominion over anything. We are responsible for figuring things out. Sex is a matter of informed consent. Marriage is acknowledged as a human invention. We recognize that sometimes bad luck is just bad luck. There is no divine justice, there is no karma. This life is the only one that matters. We must love and comfort each other. And finally, this planet and all its life is ours to protect. This is important. We can understand the consequences of our actions and we must act that way. No God will save us. 
No God will save the planet. The earth and the living things on it are holy. That is, they are worthy of supreme respect. Not because they are supernatural, but because they are life. And that is amazing and precious enough. Thank you. Awesome. Woohoo! And um, people who go to an anatomy and physiology course really, really want to learn. So I have rarely had sort of specific sticking points other than the obvious things, which you as a doctor can probably remember things like, so how does aerobic respiration in the <laughs> cell go again? You know, things like that. Um, but in terms of sort of uh, religious sticking points, I do refer to evolution in my lectures because it makes the body make sense. Hence the title of my book, The Not-So-Intelligent Designer. The human body, just study A&P sometime, the human body does not come up to even reasonable design specifications, much less supernatural ones, okay? So, when I talk about this, when I talk about why the testicles hang outside the body, and this is the perfect first argument for the bad design of the human body. I mean, why put something that vulnerable outside the body? I'd like to know. Anyway, the point is when I refer to evolution in this context, or when people will ask, when a student wants, why is the organ that way? Whatever organ it is, there are some weird things out there. Um, I say, because we evolved. We're stuck with it. This is our history. This is how we got there. Or if I'm talking about stuff like the cell membrane and I talk about how it's made out of particular lipids that repel water on one side but like water on the other side, that they just naturally form membranes. There's no brilliant designer there. It's just the way that phospholipids act. You put phospholipids in water, they form bilipid membranes. It's what they do. No magic, just chemistry. Um, so I refer to that and getting to your point. Um, sometimes I'll have a student say, well, but you know, uh, you know, what about the Bible? And what I say, and I think this is actually pretty good, I say, okay, if you don't believe that every word in the Bible is literally true, if you don't believe that, then you really have no problem with evolution. On the other hand, if you do believe that every word of the Bible is literally true, you have much bigger problems than evolution. <laughs> there are four corners of the earth according to the Bible. So is the, or do you really believe that the earth is a square? If you don't, then seriously, you don't have problems with evolution. And, you know, by and large, they're okay with that. And, you know, we can just move along in terms of, you know, doing the important stuff of learning about the body. Next, yes. Hi, um, I'm a transgender, um, bisexual, uh, queer activist, and I would like to make some comments about your lecture. Sure. Um, and we can talk more afterwards if you want to. Oh, sure. Um, first off, um, the term transsexual is kind of dated in the community. I know academia. Yeah. So, sorry, I, I, I enunciated a little bit. Sorry, I didn't understand what you said. Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, the the term transsexual is actually dating the community because people, like I know academia is a little behind that. Um, it's due to the fact that cisgender people think that trans people uh, transition to have sex, not because they have some internal sense of gender. So typically if you're talking about trans people, that term is kind of dated. Also, um, instead of referring to like original um, sex, uh, we use instead like assigned or designated at birth because it's less othering. Um, and uh, also arguments that conflate sex and gender can sometimes be damaging. And you seem to be doing that in this lecture. And it's not, it makes sense to a lot of people and that's good, but then other people it can like um, harm, like uh, they think, oh, it's just in the head and then like, you know, da 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 with gender. So. Well, I've had these discussions with various members of the community in the past, and so, you know, I could call it transgender, but then that causes problems as well. 
um, because in the case of the fish, they are changing oh, no, no, no. their I, reproductive sex. It was more when you were talking about the humans. The sex, when you're talking about fish, is totally fine. But when you're actually talking about humans, please use transgender. Like when you were talking about bathroom bills. Yeah, uh-huh. So. so you would prefer transgender for humans? Yes. Okay, I've heard other people request the opposite, so it's a very complicated The community subject. is like evolving and yeah. changing yeah. over right. time, and there's right. different ways and, and, and it happens yeah. fast, and I can't always keep up, because as you said, I'm busy doing academic stuff. Yeah, totally. uh, But I'm very happy to have input, because I do want to keep up as best I can. Thank you. Sure. Hi, FSM. Hello, how are you? Um, so I want to say first that I found this topic delightful, particularly because you are absolutely unapologetic about just putting these things out there um, in a very factual way. And a lot of times people are like, oh, you know, have you considered, and you're just telling things like they are, and I really appreciate that. Um, the second thing is you taught me something today because I did not know any male organisms were XX, and I consider myself a pretty active skeptic, so thank you very much for that. And then my question is, um, do you have suggestions for people like me who get into these discussions and cite evidence and then are told, yes, but human beings are a special case? Because that's something I run into often. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. That is one that I have heard before, and I find it kind of weird and interesting. I have had more than one person say, well, but you're talking about animals. You're not talking about people. And, well, there's a couple of things there. First of all, if they're arguing from the standpoint of religion, they really ought to learn some theology because there is a whole branch of theology called natural theology. And it is supposedly based on nature, if only nature was exactly the way they made it up to be. So as I said, they call it the argument from nature, but in that case, one responds with real nature, which is what I'm doing here. So, you know, thing one is, you know, maybe you can say something about natural theology and how they ought to learn their own religion sometime. But the other thing to say, I think, or that we can talk about, is, okay, so you don't want to talk about any animals other than humans, and humans are animals, by the way. But if you look at human societies all over the globe, and, particular, and including ones that have not been changed or much changed by Western Europeans and North Americans and the like, you will find every possible community organization, sexual relationship organization, social organization, you name it, you can find it in human primates. So if you only want to look at people, you can go out and talk to an anthropologist or a sociologist about all the things that are done all over the world, and they still lose. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure. Hi, I'm really curious about, um, I read an article where they discuss animals. I read an article where they discussed animals, birds and butterflies in particular, that could be born where one half of them was male and one half was female. They called it bilateral hmm. gymorphism or something. Um, if you know anything about that, can you speak about that a little? I'm interested in that from a creative perspective to put it into like a sci-fi story or something. I hadn't actually heard of those. I mean, there are plenty of hermaphrodites in nature where they have both male and female sex organs just on a routine basis. I don't know about the specific case that you're talking about. So what was it called again, please? Um, it's, I'm not going to say it correctly because oh, that correct. is not my, that is not my science. It's um, bilateral, let's see. Sorry. I have an article here I could share with you afterwards. Okay. It's like bilateral dimorphism or something like that. Okay, no, it makes sense. It's not one I had heard of before, but nature is really creative. <laughs> gynandromorphism. Bilateral <laughs> gynandromorphism. Okay, gynandromorphism, that makes perfect sense. Gyn, female, andro, male, morph, which means body type, basically. Cool, thank you. Hi there. Um, oh, so I'm so nervous. 
Um, you might have already said this. Uh, I can't really trying to find mm -hmm. her, but um, how long have you been uh, studying all of this, like delving into the different like levels of just understanding? Okay, that's. Did you? Sorry, Carrie. I'm oh, I'm sorry. I get kind of just uh, just um, just. It's so interesting, and I'm not exactly the most informed human being on the planet, but uh, just being able to come here and listen to you speak, even if it was just maybe 20 to 30 minutes, like has been uh, eye-opening. It's like a lot to learn, you know. Oh well, thank you so much. Well, here's the thing that's really cool, and I mean, this is why I do things like Dragon Con because I want to be able to talk to people who didn't study biology and who haven't been studying it for the past, I'm not going to tell you how many years. <laughs> um, but here's the really cool thing, and this is something that for all the talks that I've done thus far, and I have a bunch of ones that I do, I try to use things that have been in the biological literature for decades. So, let me see. The, I read about um, sort of same-sex marriage, if you will, in seagulls back in the 70s when I was in college. The research was new then. Uh, and why, again, as an undergraduate, I was told by my marine biology professor to go to the Smithsonian and go into the research wing, and I was given a special pass and all this kind of stuff. And I went to the aquarium there, uh, simply known as the fish tank, but where they had um, one school of, I don't even remember which kind of transsexual fish it was, but it was something we had learned about in class, where there was, this was one of those fish where you have a school that is all female except for one male who does the breeding, and then when that male dies, one of the females transitions becomes the new male, and off they go. So I have known about some of this stuff since the 70s. Um, and, you know, this stuff about the fish and this kind of thing is just a part of the undergraduate biology curriculum. The thing that has bugged me forever is that all this stuff that we just know doesn't get out into the public at large, which is why I do what I do. And so what happened then was many decades went by and I thought about this stuff. And then in the summer of 2016, when we had the bathroom bills and we had the pulse shooting, and I just thought to myself, I already know enough to debunk this stuff. So why don't I do it? Um, and then, of course, I had to read up on what had happened in the you know, 30, 40 preceding years to see what else had happened. And obviously, a lot of research has been done since I was an undergraduate. It was really fun reading up on it. I'm probably behind again at this point. But that's kind of how it happened. There's a lot of this stuff, it's in the biological literature, it's been there for ages in some cases, and it just hasn't gotten out into the public, which I think is a real shame. But that's why I do what I do, so please tell your friends about me. They can look up YouTube videos that I've done and stuff like that. So, you know, there's fun stuff out there, and I really want people to hear about it. So thank you. Hi, um, so as a trans man living in North Carolina, um, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> but I was wondering, so in the DSM-5, they um, describe gender dysphoria as the distress of being in the body of a, the opposite gender that you identify with. In each no, sorry, what, what book was that? DSM-5. Oh, okay, DSM-5, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if there was, obviously we don't like able to understand like the specific brains of animals, but I was wondering if there was, um, or like how they're thinking about things, but I was wondering how, if there was any showing of like distress when animals are um, transsexual and changing from one gender to the other, or is it strictly just because of them um, wanting reproductive success? Now that's a really interesting question. I mean, with these fish that I was talking about, they transition back and forth. It's, you know, it's a part of their reproductive strategy. Um, that would be an interesting question. Um, you know, you'd have to figure out how to study stress in fish, which, I mean, could be done. I mean, there are behavioral cues. There are probably hormonal cues. I'm not a fisheries biologist myself, but I am an animal behaviorist. So, you know, there might be signs of stress that could be looked for, but 
You know, I wouldn't be surprised if it's just kind of something that happens. Um, and I won't say they're pretty used to it, but, you know, as I said, it's, you know, just what happens kind of like, you know, growing up or your toenails growing or whatever the case may be that just kind of happens and you don't really think about it. But I don't know. It's an interesting question. Thank you. Very much for your talk. I really like and I really enjoy learning about interesting like sexual strategies in different species. Um, so I heard one um, back in college that was some kind of a flatworm, and uh, they would engage in reproduction by fencing with their penises <laughs> because they didn't want to be the female because it was more energetically expensive to have the uh, eggs. Uh, fertilized. I'm loving this. This is great. It may come to another talk, you know. Yes. <laughs> so they would fence with their penises, yes, and uh, they would like stab the sperm into the other one. It was weird. Mm -hmm. Look up the YouTube Don't videos, guys. Um, <laughs> These are flatworms. Some yeah, flatworms. Some kind of here. flatworm. I can't okay. remember specifically. But my question was, um, why would you think for reproductive strategies, why would some species that you talked about switch from being a male which is less expensive um, to a uh, female which is slightly more energetically expensive. Okay, this is actually a really good point on all kinds of levels, and this is the kind of thing that evolutionary biologists love to think about. Um, it kind of goes like this. Females are, generally speaking, more likely to reproduce. They are almost guaranteed to reproduce if they grow up to reproductive age. With males, it's more of like taking a ticket in the lottery. Maybe you'll win big, or maybe you'll get nothing. Um, you know, one male can fertilize a whole lot of females. Uh, but on the other hand, there are a lot of males who don't fertilize any females, so it's a more high-risk strategy. And so you will actually see, under different conditions, you will see, even in multicellular organisms, you will see strategies change depending upon the environment. Um, and yes, uh, gestating an egg or you know, gestating um, an embryo is more energetically expensive. So in some respects, there's that that goes into the equation as well. You know, if I'm male, I can fertilize all of these females. It doesn't take that much energy out of me. Gee, that's great. On the other hand, there is the risk of never, ever reproducing at all. So as I said, it's like all these things go into this great sort of almost decision matrix that evolution does, except that, of course, evolution doesn't plan or do anything. Um, that's one thing that's actually really important to keep in mind at all times is that even when we talk about it that way, just it's, it's like something happened and it worked and the individuals lived long enough to reproduce and so that particular gene combination kept going and that's all that evolution is. But it means that all kinds of weird things can happen, but as I said, what you are likely to see succeed and therefore in the present time are things that have kind of had those different factors included somehow. Did that answer the question? Yes. I mean, it's a really fun topic. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'll go on. Thank you. Are we out of time? Yep. Got one, one more. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, the situation that you bring up where the male, and he has these several females, I think it's with the fish thing, he dies, one of the females takes over and off they go. Right. Okay, so what stress and organization among the females decides that? Could you pick out which female would be the one to replace the male? Or we don't know, it's random. How is, how is that decided? There's been research done on that, and I cannot speak with complete authority on it because I haven't read the latest. So it's, it's ongoing thought process. It's ongoing research, but it usually seems to be that one of the biggest ones is the one who will become the male. So it is almost possible if you saw the whole community, you could actually say, well, that's the likely takeover person of fish, whatever. Probably, but that's the one where I'm not going to, you know, stake my reputation on it because right. I haven't read the latest literature. Right. 
I'm sure somebody has tried that because, of course, scientists love trying to make predictions and then see if they come out or not. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if that's the way it works, but I can't guarantee it. Right, so there's some thought process going on there. Yeah, well, thought or behavioral process, right. let's call it. I actually have a question because something came up during a conversation with a friend of mine, like recently. So originally the description of the sperm fertilizing the human egg was that the sperm are working, it was a very phallocentric sort of description that the, the egg is this female damsel in distress and she might send out this chemotaxis and so the sperm would swim up the uh, concentration gradient to whatever chemical she's secreting and um, because as I recall in medical school they talked about that there was, there was more than 50% that would go down the correct fallopian tube. Um, and so, but I understand that there's more recent data that the egg may actually take a much more active role in in engulfing the sperm. Can you talk about that? Do you know anything about no, that? No, this sounds like lots of fun and a good thing for me to read up on at some point. <laughs> we can exchange emails about this. Oh, I'd love um, to. Because, no, that sounds really, I know that there has been a lot of work done on that. And there's even a question as to whether the sperm are competing or cooperating. So there's a lot of cool stuff out there that is questioning the old model of the egg sits there and, you know, lots of sperm swim up to it and one of them gets lucky, basically. There appears to be more to it than that, but I'm not up on the latest. Uh, but it's a really, really interesting subject. Any more last couple of minutes, uh, would you please uh, let people know your email address, where to get in touch with you, if you have a website, more books for sale? Ah, okay, yes. Shameless plug, minute and a half. Right, yeah, um, I, I have cards here that I can give you with my email address on it. I am on Facebook, you can find me there. I have written the two books. Um, one of which is available on Amazon, The Not-So-Intelligent Designer. Um, let me see, what else? I'm not as out there uh, on the web as I should be. That's an ongoing project. But you can look up all my videos on the web. If you just Google something like Abby Hafer and Unintelligent Design, you'll see my Unintelligent Design video, which is a studio video. You can look up Abby Hafer, Unintelligent Design, Gender Binary, or everything you know about sex, and you will get this talk, uh, which I did in another, at another conference one time. Uh, if you Google Abby Hafer animals that shouldn't exist according to intelligent design, that will also bring up a fun video with more animals in cute pictures. Um, so there are lots of fun things out there that you can see that I have done. And other than that, just please make nice Psychons. If you like. Psychon. Psychon. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I will be, I will be appearing at CSICon this October in Las Vegas, and I will be appearing at California Free Thought Day in Sacramento also this coming October. I will be giving this talk at CSICon. I will be giving a different talk um, about why intelligent design is wrong and why it is a political issue, not a scientific controversy. Thank you very much. Um, and what you can do about that, so I'll be talking about that at California Free Thought Day, which should be a whole lot of fun, and it will involve a call and response where I'm going to try and get the audience to shout balls. So, <laughs> if you are going... We'll totally do that now, right? Y'all want to do it? Yeah. All right, on the count of three. One, two, three. Balls! balls. Thank you. So, wait, wait, I, I want to try it one more time here. So, if... Can I use the hand? Can you hear it? Is this on? Hello? No, it's not. Ah, there we are. Okay, so, so, if someone in your state legislature or on your school board says, intelligent design is just as scientific as evolution, you say, balls! Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, and I really, really appreciate it. That was wonderful. So uh, please remember to rate the sessions that you've seen. Um, is Margaret back there? Okay. Margaret's still